Welcome back to another episode of the Borough for Borough podcast, where we take a bite out of the Big Apple real estate scene. Now, if this is your first time listening to us or watching us, make sure you hit that like, that subscribe, so that you can follow us on our journey. But if you have been following us over the last two episodes, you've heard us talk about some of our favorite up and coming neighborhoods, some of our favorite neighborhoods to live in, and some of the attractions associated with them. But for episode three, we're going to talk about the money, about investing in New York City. So, team, let's go into it. Let's go. Hey, how you doing? What's going on, Isaiah? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. So I personally haven't invested yet in New York City, though I've lived here my whole life. Uh, but once I get my money right, I do want to, you know, decide on the right place, the right property to be okay. able to put some money in and watch it grow. Right. Uh, sure. But Isaiah, Scotty, I know the both of you yes, are yes. pretty savvy at it now. So yeah. talk to us about it. Um, so f- for me, um, I purchased my first property in 2019. It was a uh, two family. Mm. Two family, so it was a two over two, two beds over two beds, one bath. Um, and what I did was I just, I went straight to renting it out yeah, mm-hmm. right away. And um, from there, I purchased the next one, like the following year, actually, another two uh-huh. family. And this one is a different strategy because I just did Airbnb. Yeah. So, and it's pretty lucrative. Um, sold the first house, you know, uh-huh. and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been good. Um, investing is the way, man. I, I, yeah. I try to I try to tell people, you know. Definitely, real estate is it. Yeah. Did real you know when you bought those properties that that it was going to be an, an Airbnb? Like you went into it in, initially. No. That? No, not at all. Actually, I, I didn't like the rental aspect of it so much because I was the property manager. So, yeah. mm-hmm. but I mean, I'm still the property manager of Airbnb. But it's just dealing with somebody on a consistent basis mm-hmm. for a whole year versus somebody that's coming in for a week, two weeks, and they're gone. Yeah. And it's like, all right, cool. When you're dealing with somebody for a long period of time, you have more problems, more situations, and it's just like, they get comfortable. So I never want to get anybody too comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want like, to do too. Yeah, just turnover, turnover. Next, who's coming? Yeah. So I'm so. curious, were you like nervous in the beginning? Like, what was the process like? Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, the first property uh, didn't need that much work, so that was okay. But the second property, I was hands-on. So okay. mm-hmm. it was a lot of work. Um, my dad helped me, like I had cousins, friends, everybody was like pitching in to help. So it's it was definitely frightening when you know, when you don't you can't see your way out almost. It's like you're struggling to just get it done. But um we got it done. We got it done. It took it took me a while. I'm st- I mean I'm still working on the property. So yeah. Construction? D- yeah, yeah, oh. definitely. So I have a basement to do. Yeah. I literally just finished the attic not long ago. Um, so it it's it's major. But I will say, um, I learned a lot of lessons, um, not to cut corners, mm-hmm. not to, you know, save and trying to save a, a, a dollar and you, you wind up spending more in the end. So if it's, you know, something that you really you dedicate yourself to and you, you can do it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you, Isaiah? Um, investing is cool, but, you know, I would always advise anyone before you go into an investment because investing sounds cool. It sounds trendy, right? But you would have to, you have to, have to, have to do your homework and figure out what your business model is. Because you can flip a house, buy a house, renovate it, flip it, or you can buy and hold it. Um, For each strategy, you definitely need to do your homework, figure out what the comps are. So figure out what the after repair value would be. So if you're going to flip a house, it's important to figure out what the after repair value will be and kind of work back from there. Um, If you're buying a home to hold it, you got to figure out what the rents will be and figure out if, you know, with the purchase cost and the construction cost, right. whether you're going to cash flow. And yeah. so um, that's what I would say. But it's um, challenging in New York City, man. I'm it's sure. challenging yeah. trying to figure out contractors, um, that's, permits. <laughs> like that's one of the biggest know. that's yeah. one of the biggest problems I had was finding like a, a great contractor, you know, somebody that was going to do the work sufficiently yeah. and get it done on time. And, and obviously for a, a decent amount right a costly yeah. price you know yeah but um yeah that, that's that's the difficult part but i say once you find a team it's it's like sailing from this this beautiful set here at studio 1873 is brought to you by the everset the everset provides full service staging and furniture rental solutions in the new york area for more information please visit us at staging.theeverset.com or email us at staging at to request a free proposal 
Yeah. I mean, we're in New York City, and so there's, you know, we've talked about co-ops, we've talked about condos, we've talked about single family, multifamily. Yeah. So when you guys are talking about your investment properties, I know, Scotty, you mentioned a two-family. What about for you? Did, was yours also a multifamily? Yeah. So um, my first house bought in 2012, that was a two-family. Um, I bought another one, two, which I use as a single family. And then I recently bought a four family last year, which was crazy. Um, only one of both, two of them I've had to do like gut renovations on. Yeah. Yeah. The other one was moving, moving condition. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, Good. But yeah. in terms of like where in the city, where there are certain neighborhoods, I mean, we know you're the Brooklyn guy, so I'm sure this is all in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you know what? I'm never really fussed on the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's about your business model and are you gonna make a return, right? right? Yeah. Um, New York City, I think even in, yeah, even in New York, wherever you are in New York City, you can make a return because people wanna be there, right? Sure. Whether you're in Queens, I'm not sure why you wanna go there, <laughs> but whether you're in Queens, Bronx, oh, I Manhattan. I got some stats for you, don't yeah. worry. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna wear my Mets hat today, but. <laughs> yeah, um, it really just depends on seeing like, yeah. if, it makes, if it makes sense to yeah. do it financially. Yeah. But I don't, like I'm not really fussed in the neighborhood. Yeah. I've got it in Crown Heights, Flatbush and Bushwick. Yeah. So I don't yeah. really, for those me, it don't really, it don't yeah. matter yeah. where. And those are all private sense. neighborhoods too. Yeah. 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 As long as it makes sense. But like, even like now in Bed, um, now in Brooklyn, I know like Bay Ridge um, and Bed Stuy are neighborhoods that are thriving. Um, Bed Stuy has always been brewing, yeah. but you still have opportunities out there. Um, I know investors that are picking up brownstones for like 1 million to like 1.4 really? million wow. on the cheap. wholesale. Yeah. Right. But then on the, re on the resale, they're selling it for like 2.5, 2.8. Two, yeah. yeah. But they got to be that. able to hold those costs over that time. Right? Sure. Exactly. But that's in Bed-Stuy. I know in, um, in Bay Ridge, which is like on the southwestern corner mm -hmm. of um, Brooklyn, where you have the Verrazano Bridge, yeah, yeah. Um, they're picking it up for, they're picking up like one, uh, two to three family homes, like 700, mm. 650. Wow. So and they're going. resaling it for like 1.7, 1.8. So like there's opportunities there. You sure. just have to kind of dig deep and figure out where you're going to get those opportunities yeah. and yeah. move on them. So let me ask you, the, the investors that you're working with and, and that you know of, they're purchasing with hard money. Like what are they, how, how are they going about it? Yeah. Most of them are purchasing with hard money. Okay. There's this myth that people buy with cash. Yeah. It's never really cash. It's right? not cash. Yeah. They're, lend, they're borrowing the money, yeah. and it's hard money. The um, And real quick, for those at home who don't know what hard money, obviously we're a little bit more savage. Just give a quick synopsis of what that means, like hard money lending. Hard money is just, um, I guess there's not as much regulation okay. on the lending. So um, when you like borrow finance to buy a house, the mortgage, there's a lot more red tape that you need to go through. Mm -hmm. um, Underwriting, with, and, yeah, yeah. With um, with hard money, is more so they look at yeah, your LLC, look at your experience, and things right. of that nature, and they look at the ARV and see what the purchase price is, and if it makes sense, then right. they'll they'll lend. So you they're the just money. looking at the finished product, just not the numbers. looking at where you're coming from. No, yeah. they're looking at where you're coming from. They're going to make sure right. like you're not going to be in a hole. Sure. Mm -hmm. Like put it this way, <laughs> if you're going to buy a house for two million and think you're going to sell it at two point four, but you need to put in five right. um, five hundred thousand. It, right. They're not going to borrow it. Right. 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 It's, it's just all based on the numbers, basically. So if the deal makes sense on paper and yeah. the numbers add up for them and they're going to make a profit, obviously, mm -hmm. then they're going to give you that loan. Okay. Yeah. So, Tracy, yeah. I know you've worked with a lot of investors. So, do. you know, we're in New York City. Investors are everywhere. They're from out of town wanting to invest here. So when an investor approaches you and they say, Tracy, tell me where the place that I need to be right now in New York City is. What are you telling them? So it's always going to be that cultural neighborhood that's rapidly changing. Mm. Um, I would say Harlem and Morningside Heights in the last few, like 10 years, yeah. has vastly grown. Um, Columbia has expanded all the way past 125th Street. They mm. put like four yeah. new devs there. Yeah. They're building high sky highs. They put two new schools. So wow. that's an area where it's in high demand. They're yeah. getting high rents. And that's where the developers and the investors are going. Mm. Cool. So it's like they're looking to see, naturally with investment, the rule is you want to buy low and invest high. But is it are are there people who are, you know, looking for something quicker where you're going to tell them like, no, if you want something that's quick, 
this is not the place for you. You need to be thinking about it long term or do they just naturally no, these, know? These deals can happen quick because yeah. you can have a two bedroom in that area for about a million dollars and mm -hmm. you can have a rental price of 5500 right. 6000 in that area so okay. it's something that can happen quick and especially a lot of these new devs in the beginning they give a lot of incentives yeah. right. to the yeah. uh, investor so they definitely go up quickly. some of the investors you work with do they focus more on like cults on condos or townhouses condos for sure oh yeah mm -hmm. right. why do you think that is well right now too what i'm seeing in harlem especially is a lot of the boutique buildings that have about six to eight units. Mm -hmm. So they're buying them at as low as two million, a little bit under two million, especially if the, the if they're an SRO, which is a single room occupancy, that they can change the building class into a two family, mm -hmm. four family, six family. Yeah. And they're gutting them out. They're putting a million, a million and a half into it, and they're dividing them into um, apartments. So you're getting about six to eight units and you can rent those for about like 5,000, 4,000. Yeah. So, and then there's a lot of schools over there. You have Columbia, you have Hostess co uh, College. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of yeah. students in there in that area. You know, the funny thing is, right, you mentioned SROs and for a long time, a lot of investors used to stay away from SROs. Yeah. But because of the ban on Airbnbs, a lot of investors are going back to SROs right. yeah. because that's a loophole where you can kind of do an Airbnb yeah. Yeah. Right. in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the time frame to change SROs to a multifamily, yeah. they have time to wait. So they'll buy the property, they'll right. sit on it, and then they'll change the building class and start renovations. So yeah. definitely investors tend to buy more SROs. Sure. Jason, so you said something that I think us as real estate professionals know and, and understand, but for those at home who obviously we're talking about apartments, first thing that everyone thinks about as a condo, but for someone who may look at the the price difference between a condo and a co-op, would you ever recommend someone to actually invest in a, in a co-op? So if I have a buyer that's looking to buy for the first time, a lot of them do see that future plan of investing in the property after they move out. Yeah. Typical stay, I think they say for a first time home buyer is like seven, seven years, years now. Yeah, yeah. So um, they're always asking that question like, okay, I know co-ops have restrictions, right? Can you find out how long I can live there before I can start subletting? Mm -hmm. So most co-ops are about two, one to two, two years. years yeah. You have to be a primary resident and then you could rent it out. Yeah. yeah. So they typically go for condos. <coughs> yeah. Ain't that similar in Queens? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. very similar. I mean, I've run into actually more co-ops that are restrictive very than right. I've seen them that are actually willing to. Sure. Um, I actually had a situation the other day with, uh, with a, a buyer um, who, you know, she's she's a young person. She's excited about purchasing her first property, and she has all intentions of actually staying there. She's not looking at it as an investment, right. mm. but her parents, rightfully so, they want to make sure that she's thinking about the long term, mm -hmm. and they're thinking from an investment standpoint, can you actually rent this out? So we were, when I say, like, literally, she was about to sign the contract. Mm. We're in the, we're in oh, the wow. lawyer's office, and her lawyer's like, he's like, Matt, I just went back over the bylaws oh, and, no. and you can't actually, <laughs> you can't rent this out ever. And wow. you know, in my mind, I was like, well, we, we never talked about that. Yeah, right. Right. But that all sucks. that to say, you know, knowing that a lot of folks, naturally you're in New York and her parents are right in, in what they're thinking of, okay, sure. if, if we're going to invest in this, we want to be able to make sure that God forbid she ever wants to move out. Yeah. We can turn this into turn some kind of investment vehicle. But in Queens, I've actually seen, especially in the areas that she was looking in, which is like the Woodside, Sunnyside area, where when a lot of those buildings were converted, it was intended that these buildings were just for primary occupation. So you really have to do a lot more digging to identify the places that you can find a lot more of those sure. opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I tend to, for folks, you know, if we have that conversation early on and this is something that you want to rent out, right. you make sure that it's something that we have to identify the right pockets of places that, that exist if you're going to be looking in Queens because nine times out of ten, it's going to be for something that's primary occupation. And you said Sunnyside. Yeah. Where else in Queens? Yes. Um, so Sunnyside, Woodside, um, Forest Hills is a big place for, for co-ops. There's a ton of inventory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because there's so much inventory, I would probably say at least 60 to 70 percent of them, you are going to find, especially in the nicer buildings, they are going to be the ones that are primary yeah. um, residency. But there are a lot more. You know, I just, uh, just went into contract with um, a studio actually in Forest Hills uh, right off of 67th Road mm. um, in Queens Boulevard. And that throughway, um, that's a bustling area. That's like the main street. It's Queens Boulevard. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of folks, a lot of younger folks who want to live over there. And for them, the first thing out of their mouth 
is can I rent this out? Right. And after how sense. long? And right. so right. in places like a Forest Hills where you're getting a lot more people that are having an appetite to to move there, that's the first thing on their mind is how quickly can I rent sure. this out? Right. Yeah. And right. I think that was that's actually a good strategy because mm-hmm. I feel I know a few people that have house hacked by doing that. Yeah. So maybe they'll sure. buy a co-op or right. a condo. And then after a certain amount of years, they'll move on to a two family right. and then go Gain on some to equity. a four family. Yeah, yeah get some things equity, of yeah. that nature. So that's not actually not a bad yeah. idea to do right. such a thing. Yeah. And especially with the low buy in. I mm. mean, naturally, like we talked about before, co-ops, you're going to see a lower entry point. And sometimes the, the negative perception is that because you have to deal with a co-op board and sometimes they can be restrictive, it's not the smartest investment vehicle or even an avenue. Yeah. But like we're saying, there are some I, some ways that you can get around it sure. if you make sure you do the research up front to know yeah. what the rules are. Right. Yeah. For sure. But based off what you guys were saying, though, and I'm really curious to know what other markets are like because multifamily is a big thing here, especially in the outer boroughs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Scotty, I'm not sure where well, New York yours is. Well, it's it, it's in the Bronx, but um, when, when I say when I think about the Bronx, it's it's literally full of co-ops. Like yeah. there are, I can probably count on one hand how many condo units or condo buildings are in the Bronx. Yeah. So I tend to deal with a lot of co-ops. Yeah. And it can be like you said, it's it's you have to know you know go in and know like what's your strategy, like how long do I want to stay in this place. And where am I going next, right? right. Um, so I, I literally just did like a um, showings, a few showings actually with a few buyers. Um, it was a building, a condo building in Mont Haven. It's a uh, two thirty, uh, two twenty five East one thirty eighth Street actually, and it's one of like the only condo buildings in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And it's a one bed. So I showed them a one bedroom, and it's it was listed for four ninety nine. So taxes on it about three three hundred dollars, and the common charges are three hundred dollars. So. Yeah. But um, estimated your yeah, estimated payment is probably roughly going to be a little over three thousand. Wow! Know? So it's like so you telling people to invest in in a- absolutely. I mean, if, if and all the buyers that I had, they all worked in Midtown, mm-hmm. right? So the train station is literally one block away, six train, six line. You get down to Midtown, Forty Second Street, maybe fifteen minutes. You know, so okay. Yeah, it's, it's, all right, so we we got our nice little um, introduction into real into investing. But I think this is a good time for a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the specific neighborhoods that we think are primed for investment. Sure. So let's take a quick break, team. We'll be right back. Let's do it. What do you really need to know about buying or selling a home? First, it's serious business. And it's complicated. There's a lot of money on the table and emotion, too. You need an agent who knows the ropes. So, whether you're buying or selling your home, work with professionals who have a mastery of the craft. All right, so we are back. And as you can see, we got a treat. So, I'm, I'm going to dig into this, but I want Scotty, who brought this in, to tell us what do we have here, because I'm excited. I'm going to be really greedy in a second. <laughs> so, today we have uh, Lloyd's Bakery. So this is well known. Well known. Um, so it's Betty Campbell, who's the owner, Betty Campbell Adams, and her husband, with the help of her great grandmother, uh, Secret Recipe. Um, they founded this delicious cake. I'm going to take a bite really quick. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so good. But um, so they founded this. It's, it's Jamaican. They're Jamaican from Jamaican descent. Big up. Yeah. And they have uh, two locations actually. So one in the Bronx and uh, Philston. And then there's also another location on Lexington Avenue, 100th uh-huh. Street. Uh-huh. Yeah, so yeah, it's pretty I mean, good. I've been hearing about Lloyd's carrot cake for decades. Yeah, it's right? like yeah. a household staple. Staple yeah. in the neighborhood yeah. for sure. Yeah, well, people, I've never heard of it. But yeah, but I'll definitely be going there. Yeah, yeah. people yeah. come from all over nice. to, to get this. Yeah, I'm we, not a huge fan of carrot cake. Let me see. <laughs> it's good. It's good. No, it's really good. And likewise, carrot cake is not my go-to, but this is pretty darn good. Yeah. So I get it. So if you're ever in the Bronx, you definitely it's and in Harlem, or Harlem, Harlem, yeah. Definitely get this because mm. this is good. Really good. But, um, yeah, before the break, we were talking about, you know, places to invest. And, Scotty, you were talking about the Bronx. Yeah. Um, but let's stay let's stay on that topic and let's talk about some of the neighborhoods that we think, from an investment standpoint moving forward, are some of the places that if any listeners at home who are thinking about investing or if they're just curious, where are the places that we think we would recommend moving forward? Me, um, good question. So I was speaking to uh, Ruben Isgelov from um, Wheeland, which are the hard money 
lender. Okay. Um, they do a high volume of work throughout the city. Um, but I spoke to him yesterday in preparation for this podcast, and he said that he's seen a lot of activity from his investors in Bushwick, mm-hmm. um, which makes sense to me, actually, because mm-hmm. Bushwick is just east of Williamsburg, and everyone knows Williamsburg. The price points is high, yeah. skyrocketing yeah. over there. And you also have like a lot of young families over there. So if you're like, if you want that environment and you want to stay close to that neighborhood, it makes sense to flock over like just east to the next neighborhood, which is Bushwick. Sure. Um, Bushwick is made up of a lot of uh, multi-family houses, two, three, mo- two, three family houses. Yeah. A lot of them are framed. Mm-hmm. And um, the price point, actually, that a lot of investors are picking up houses in Bushwick is around the seven to eight hundred um, mark. And they're re- I just looked on the street easy today. They're on the market for like two point two, two point three over there in yeah. Bushwick. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, Bushwick is apparently um, a neighborhood that a lot of investors cool. are seeing a lot of activity. But that makes sense, though, because I think for an investor, if I'm putting my, myself in the mindset of. Why do I want to invest in a place? I want mm. to flock to where I know renters are going to be. People are willing to spend a little bit more money to be able to live. Right. And just like you said, in, in Williamsburg, a lot of people are priced out, especially a lot of younger people. So they're going to go to Bushwick. But because of that, there's a lot of people who are even starting to get pushed out of Bushwick. And for those who don't know their geography, right next to Bushwick is where is it? <laughs> Here we oh, go. Ridgewood. Is Ridgewood, which is where I think. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so Ridgewood, Queens, um, and Bushwick basically share an invisible border. You know, right. there's literally, there's parts of it that you wouldn't even realize that you're crossing over. And so for that reason, I actually think as far as um, initial investment, people who are looking to maybe be in Brooklyn, because like we talked about before, there's some folks who just want to say that they live in Brooklyn mm. or own a property in right. Brooklyn or are investing in Brooklyn. If for them... They think that Bushwick is that place for that reason. But from a pricing standpoint, they're not able to take advantage of that. Sure. I actually think Ridgewood is the perfect place for that investment because just like Isaiah said, there's a lot of multifamily properties sure. out there. Right. Um, yeah. I, I just represented um, a young family who just bought their first home out there for mm-hmm. that exact reason. Yeah. Because for them, when we initially met, they were looking for something that was just going to be a single family. And through the conversation and how much that uh, they were pre-approved for, mm-hmm. And the, we're having a conversation and, you know, they're familiar with the area. Sure. They're like, well, it actually might make more sense for us to get something that we could rent out. Yeah. And when we looked into it and dug into it, Ridgewood was actually the perfect thing for them because not only is it close to kind of the scene where there's so much happening in Ridgewood, but as far as affordability, you know, that entry price point that Bushwick is now starting to push up, yeah. you can still find some some headwinds in Ridgewood where you're still getting things for, you know, six, seven hundred. Right. But they're already in some solid enough shape that by the time you're done with it, you can have a million dollar property and have a nice cash flow every month from the renter. Yeah. yeah, I would second that actually, because I had a um a client I was working with, um, I was representing her. She was buying a place and her top choice was Bushwick, but then we found ourselves starting to go more into Ridgewood. Um, eventually she bought like in Cypress Hills, mm. which kind of neighbors both, yeah, um, sure. like both yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll second that. So you stayed away from Queens is what you say. You're like, no, no, no. no. She, <laughs> she went to Queens and she was just like, I can't do this. I have to go yeah. back into Brooklyn. Yeah, that makes sense. What, what about you, Tracy? Where are you thinking? So I would say Upper East Side. Mm, okay. Um, because it's high in rentals, yeah. prices, um, luxury, you get a mix of high end, luxury buildings and a lot of developers can get and investors can get like Mm 5,000 all the way up to 20,000 in rent. 20,000 depending on the size of the apartment. So the values there, the parks, close proximity to the parks, the shops, you know, all down Fifth Avenue. So that's kind of like the bustling area where you can get good deals. Wow, yeah. Upper East Side. Upper East Side, yeah. I, that's East Side. that's not that's a hot take. I wouldn't have thought that one, but that oh, makes yeah. a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And that's all. Like, um, are we still co- talking about co-ops and condos over there? Both. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of new devs over there, mostly co-ops. Um, cool. And there's a few townhouses, you know, uh-huh. high-priced townhouse townhouses. Yeah. But yeah. in those, that's where you can get those those crazy right. rents that you're yep. talking yeah. about. Wow. Yeah. What about you, Scotty? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say, of course, I know I sound like a broken record, but Mount Haven is probably going to be that next bet. Um, you know, you can get a two-family there. Uh, Bronx in general, like, I would say squ- uh, square footage-wise, you can probably find, you know, you can get a two-family house, 300, 
to 400 per square foot. Wow. So let's say, for example, if the house is uh, 2,500 2, square feet, you can probably, it, it'll be about 750,000. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So you can find those type of- Is that on the wholesale or retail? Um, on the retail side. Oh, yeah. yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, mm. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. And I think the, the common thing with everything that we're, we're saying and hearing is following where younger people who are looking to, to kind of pay rent, mm. uh, where are they looking to, to go? Upper East Side, you hear a lot of you know recent grads. You hear a lot of younger people flocking there naturally. You hear Bushwick a lot. And now Mont Haven is becoming yeah. one of those places. Grand yeah. Concourse, Mont Haven, a high bridge area. Yeah. Exactly. Like Grand Concourse is like, I mean, well, there's more co-ops on the Grand Concourse, but in those, you know, you have small pockets. Yep. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I yeah. have a question, yeah. right? Yeah, what's up? Um, what amenities or like neighborhood amenities are pushing people towards those neighborhoods that you mentioned? Sure, yeah, I mean, so a lot of like the, the uh, luxury co-ops on, in, in the Bronx, they have the doorman, mm. the elevator, you know, those type of things. But of course, transportation is probably gonna be the biggest aspect of it right. and why people wanna live in these places. Yeah. Cause I mean, you're priced out in a lot of other places like the Bronx, I mean, I'm sorry, Brooklyn and Queens. So a lot of those people that are priced out, they tend to flock to the Bronx because of the price points. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So yeah. transportation literally to the city, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, they can, they'd rather do that commute. You know, yeah. and and save. So the value is in in how much money they can save, right? Right. right. Yeah. But also like the bars, the restaurants. Yeah. You know that like bustling scene. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of investment in terms of being able to make sure that a lot of the neighborhood spots and you know, we have social media now. So there's places. Yeah. In the last episode we talked about Lighthouse right. in Long Island City. Like that's a place that most people wouldn't have known existed if it yeah. wasn't for social media. Yeah. And so social media is attracting a lot more people to a specific restaurant sure. that when you look at where you're at, you're right. like, man, this, this neighborhood right. is actually kind of cool. Right. Right. So yeah. I do think as far as like those amenities, people do want to be near transportation and, and commute is probably the top thing. Right. Yeah. But then right after that, what am I doing once I live there? Sure. You know, right. Is there any sure. nightlife? Am I close Parks. proximity to places that I would want to frequent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that's more or less the same with uh, Bushwick. Bushwick is very bustling. So you've got Knickerbocker Avenue and you've got Broadway as well, which are lined with restaurants and bars. So like the nightlife is good. Um, in Bushwick, you also have Maria Hernandez Park, which okay. a lot of people go to. Um, but also, like I said, it's just east of Williamsburg. So you're gonna get a lot yeah. of people from Williamsburg that are coming over. Sure. But even in terms of tra transportation, you've got the L train, you've got the JMZ, and I think you've got the G, D G train parts of Bushwick as well. Okay, yeah. So like you've got good transportation yeah. that will take you into Manhattan cool. or other parts of Brook um, yeah, other parts of Brooklyn. And what's the commute time like for the, from there? Depending on which part. So when I used to live in Bushwick, it used to take about twenty minutes to get into like okay. um financial district, cool. lower east side. Yeah. On that, That's not yeah. bad at all. On that yeah, um, I think anywhere under like 25, 30 minutes, you're good. Like, you know what I'm yeah, saying, as yeah. far as a commute? And obviously, yeah. if you're closer to the bridge, sure. it's gonna be like two stops. It's gonna yeah. be like 10 minutes to get into the sea. Yeah. So. yeah, no, I agree. And to be honest, I know I mentioned Ridgewood um, as, as an area that, especially from a multifamily standpoint, is, is gonna be attractive now and moving forward. Mm. But believe it or not, Long Island City, I know, I know you didn't think I was gonna go the whole episode without <laughs> mentioning the LIC, but here we are. But believe it or not, Long Island City, is still prime for investment. Um, now, I know we've been hearing about Long Island City for years and you know a lot of that initial boom when the developers started to um, take advantage of the rezoning, which as we know, Long Island City was primarily a manufacturing area. Yeah. But for all those same reasons that I had mentioned in the other episodes about the proximity to mm -hmm. the, um, the city, the views and all of that, Long Island City is becoming a place, just like we said, with all of the renters that are looking to move there and yeah. younger people moving there. Now that a scene is actually really being cultivated there, it's still prime for a lot of um, investor sure. dollars because yeah. though the entry point may be a little bit higher, you know, investors are still seeing that this thing is not going to end anytime soon. Yeah. Sure. And they can actually see a higher cap rate um, over time because for them, they're like, look, if people are willing to spend $4,000 on a studio, mm, right. okay, I'll develop something that I know I can continue to raise that ceiling and be able to make a high yeah. return. So mm -hmm. Long Island City, depending on if your budget um, is appropriate for it, mm -hmm. yeah. you're gonna be able to see a nice investment, uh, or excuse me, a nice return on your investment right. because no matter what, it's not going down. Yeah. Sure. 
I'm starting to feel like Long Island City is the only neighborhood in Queens. Sometimes it's the only neighborhood that makes sense. It's the popular, yeah, the hottest. Yeah. Yeah. It really yeah. is. It's, the it's been that way for a no, while. But now, you so. touched on something, yeah. though. Um, something that a lot of people miss out on is zoning. Mm-hmm. I feel like zoning is also sure. important. Yeah. If the city was to ever change zoning in a certain neighborhood, you can start to see the neighborhood changing. Yeah, that's yeah. happening uh, right now in yeah. Inwood. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah it's happening in yeah. Flatbush it's, as well, where yeah. they've changed the zoning. So sure. like, Inwood, Haven. Yeah. 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 And even in, in, in like Manhattan, where there's more commercial buildings right now, they're changing those now for you know new. Uh, they're turning it into. Uh, I'm sorry, apartments, apartment buildings mm, now. Yeah. The commercial spaces, they're all going into apartment mm-hmm. buildings. Yeah, so that's... But you talked about Inwood. I feel like Inwood doesn't get a lot of attention, but I do think that Inwood, especially considering the fact that it still is in Manhattan. Right. Um, the top I, of Manhattan. The, top the of Manhattan. very top of Manhattan. Right next to the Bronx, yeah. right? Right next to the Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> Just look it over <laughs> a little bit. I yeah. thought I was Harlem. Harlem is upper Manhattan, but Inwood is like it's the top of... Upper, uh, upper Manhattan. Mm-hmm. The highest <laughs> point of Manhattan. Yeah. Um, so if you're going from downtown, like 14th Street, it'll probably take you about an hour mm-hmm. on the train to get to Inwood. Yeah, there's take that A train stops. all the way up there. Yeah. All the way up. Yeah. I think the last stop is like 207. 207, yeah, 207. Yeah. 207. Yeah. Yeah. But that area Mama in the last Lana. few years, they started, I, I feel like they started about six years ago, mm-hmm. and it got stopped because of COVID. Yeah. And now I'm seeing Sorry, what it, stopped? The construction. Ah, uh, yeah. okay. And then now, since we've opened up, I feel like there's more and more buildings. If you're driving on the Deegan going north, you'll just see flat land of buildings yeah. and mm-hmm. then high rises, just a couple. And over the years, they just start to vastly build them. So yeah. a lot of residents aren't happy about it, long-term residents. Yeah. But sure. you know, with that comes more commercial spaces, right. more jobs. So you know, I think it's always good you know, in a sense. And and that's that's interesting that you said that because in like in the Mount Haven section there's mostly rental buildings. Like all new developments right now are mm-hmm. all rental buildings. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean so, I and feel like from an investor that's right. probably a better return, right? Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. have a rental than Which is I mean, but it kinda like takes away because there's no condos at all. Like mm-hmm. it's just rental buildings and co ops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and Long Island City is becoming that, which yeah. is kinda nuts because, you know, in Court Square, um, which is where I live, yeah. There's tons of construction going on, sure. mm-hmm. and you would think, all right, there's some mix of condos and, and rental buildings. No, it is all rental buildings. Yeah. Yeah. So for someone who bought and, and actually bought a condo or maybe even a co-op back in the day, I don't, I don't think there's many co-ops in Court Square, mm-hmm. but the condos, you know, around 2010, let's say, those some of those things are actually trading at close to 700, 800,000 when they bought them a couple of years ago for in the threes. And now that there's rental inventory that's really starting to boost up up there, if you own something there, and um, it's actually going to be even more valuable because of the scarcity of sure. what's actually in yeah, the area. For sure. Yeah, a lot of it too is the city building these buildings and they're making affordable housing. Affordable housing. Yeah. yeah. And that gives people opportunity to live in neighborhoods that they sure. normally wouldn't be able to afford. Right. So what's the website again? Oh, Housing, housing Connect. Housing Connect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that with the lottery? Yeah. yeah. Housing yeah. lottery. I used to be on that all day, every day. (laughs) But there's so much information out there now. Like it's the the internet has made it so easy to be able to learn not only about new neighborhoods, learn about things, but also just to learn about investing. I feel like you you open up your Instagram every day and somebody else is uh is telling you like why you should invest in this and the burst strategy and all these things and real estate gurus, real estate gurus, Grant Cardone's, yeah, your your leisure. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say earn your leisure. That's that's a pretty cool podcast right there, and they're always talking about investing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, but it's, as you guys are actual investors and have actually done this multiple times, where are some of the actual platforms that you go to learn about this stuff? So if it's books or uh, like audio books, I'll go to Bigger, pod, um, bigger, bigger Pockets, pockets yeah. the real estate guys. Mm-hmm. Um, on Instagram, I do follow um, a young man called, I say young man, but Jude Bernard. And I think yeah, on no. Instagram, it's, it's in Mr. Harlem, Jude, right? Ben- yeah. Jude, Mr. Is Jude it, Bernard. He's from Brooklyn, though, right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, then he does um, stuff also, it's also good to stay close to people that do this every day. Yeah. So I have a good friend of mine, Remo Foss, and I've, mm-hmm. on Instagram, he's NYC Equities. Okay. Um, he has a lot of knowledge. Um, 
both of those guys have a lot of knowledge yeah, cool. on investing, whether yeah. it's flipping or buying and holding. Yeah. Yeah. I take a lot of knowledge from them on Good the stuff. socials. So we, when me and Matthew are ready, you guys can teach us the ropes. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I'll be really <laughs> good. I know, right? But, but <laughs> if I tell Isaiah I want to invest somewhere, he's like, only talk to me if you invest in Brooklyn, right. bro. No, it can't, it can't be Queens, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you be doing that? <laughs> but no, absolutely. And I, I do think, you know, you mentioned Earn Your Leisure, you mentioned all these podcasts, and I do think um investing overall in real estate is always going to be a good thing especially depending on what your financial situation looks like mm -hmm. but investing in new york is never going to go out of style no. because never. like we said always appreciate. it's yeah. always going to appreciate so you know i learned a lot from y'all just having this conversation sure. and i'm sure folks at home did uh but you know for anyone at home who is thinking about investing in real estate in new york city you got folks here who have done it, who have worked with many investors sure. and have a lot of knowledge that they can be able to provide you because in the age when information is just everywhere, being able to key in on people who actually know what they're talking about is going to be even more important. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. agree. Uh, but that's a wrap on this episode, y'all. Really? I want to get back to this carrot cake. <laughs> this carrot cake uh, is good. <laughs> looking forward to, to doing another episode and thank you for tuning in. We'll catch for you sure. next time. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Peace. Peace.